ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Douglas with a brief introduction to tonight's colorful armchair vacation. Bluegrass, what a sweet sounding word, a word synonymous with the state of Kentucky. And what a place it is, this bluegrass state of lush rolling meadows, magnificent thoroughbreds, Kentucky colonels, and memories of the immortal Stephen Foster. This is bluegrass, your armchair vacation and mine to Kentucky. The city of Frankfort is situated on the banks of the Kentucky River. It is by no means a large city, population about 25 or 30,000, yet it is the capital of the state. The dome of the Capitol building, incidentally, was patterned after the tomb of Napoleon. On the grounds of the building is a huge concrete pedestal supporting a very attractive floral clock. Now, most floral clocks, especially in Europe, are placed in the earth. This is the only raised floral clock we've ever seen. The Frankfurt Cemetery is on the opposite bank of the river, and here they buried America's most famous pioneer and frontiersman, Daniel Boone, and his wife, Rebecca. Although Boone was born in Pennsylvania, his name is one of the three most sacred names to Kentuckians. The other two, Abraham Lincoln and Henry Clay. For more about the highly revered Boone, we went to the old state house, also in Frankfurt, and the third permanent capital of the state. This attractive building, dating back to the 1820s, is today the home of the Kentucky Historical Society. We had the pleasure of meeting the society's director, Colonel George Chin. Jack, we're in the rotunda of the old state house, the home of the Kentucky Historical Society, and the museum that houses the priceless relics of Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone is more than a legend to Kentucky and the Kentucky Historical Society. We have so many of his possessions that they are admired by 60,000 school children who come through here each year. The three most notable I have here on the table in front of me. Uh, first is the knife made by his blacksmith and gunsmith brother, Squire Boone. This is not a scalping knife. This was just an, a knife that he used in the hacking of bushes and in, in scouting work. The next is his old reliable powder horn. This horn, small as it is, held a weak supply of powder. Third, and the most important of all in the collection put together, is his famous rifle, Tick Licker. This was his pride and joy, his Indian killer, his constant companion, and in which no one ex exceeded him in his skill in the use of this weapon. So you see, Jack, although Daniel Boone has been dead for 145 years, He's still very much alive in the hearts of all Kentuckians. We left Frankfurt by the old Frankfurt Pike, the original paved road from Frankfurt to Lexington. The pike is thickly shaded by thousands of trees and flowering bushes, giving the impression of a park with a roadway through the middle. The stone wall or fence was the work of slave labor many, many decades ago. Time and again, as you drive through the bluegrass country, you'll stop to admire this empire of emerald green, an ideal place indeed in which to raise thoroughbreds and trotters. Yes, trotters too, and some of the very best. Most of the thoroughbred farms welcome visitors, and even if you've never been to the races, I think you'll be fascinated by these breeding farms and the thousands of thoroughbreds and colts raised in the bluegrass country. Let's visit just one of these famous farms, and it happens to be among the very best. This is Spendthrift. It's hard to believe that this elegant white mansion is 150 years old. It's been in the Combs family that long, and this is Mr. Leslie Combs II, the owner of Spendthrift Farms. He greeted us cordially, and later at the barns, he showed us one of the great racing thoroughbreds of our time. Jack, this is Nashua, and this is Clem Brooks' groom. 
that has been with him ever since he's been retired. Clem, would you tell Mr. Douglas something about him? The 18th of May, 1956, is when this horse become the leading money winner of the world. The 11th of October, seven years ago, he lost that record to Round Table. But it taken Round Table 52 times to break his record. This horse only started 30 times. And he's won a million two hundred and eighty-eight thousand five hundred and sixty-five dollars. And we here at Spendthrift Farm are looking for many Derby winners by this great horse. Thank you, Clem. I expect you better put him on up now. In Kentucky, the sport of kings is still a blue blood affair. It also happens to be big business example. In the past 10 years, Spendthrift has sold a million and a half dollars worth of yearlings, and these yearlings went on to win over $7 million in purses. The sign is a very small sign, but it's big enough to make sports lovers from every corner of the earth misty-eyed with sentiment. This is the final resting place of Man o' War, the greatest Kentucky thoroughbred of all time and the first truly international horse. Man o' War raced only two years, 1919-1920, and the Big Red, as he was called, went to the post 21 times and won 20 of 21, upset only once. And of course, it had to be by a horse called Upset. Man o' War sired some brilliant champions, and the best of them all was War Admiral, a triple crown winner. Churchill Downs, Louisville, Kentucky. This is Derby Day, the Kentucky Derby. And this is the day of all days in the bluegrass state. The biggest day in racing, and far and away, the most important single race on earth. The Gold Cup awarded the winner is more than a symbol, more than a measure of monetary gain. For to win the Derby is to win the first and most important step on the way to the coveted Triple Crown, which also includes, as we know, the Preakness and the Belmont later in the year. The horses head to the post, and while they do so, we enjoy a parade of our own, the latest in ladies' headgear at Churchill Downs. At the wire, it's Lucky Debonair paying ten fifty to win, but earning much richer rewards. A golden chapter in the history of thoroughbred racing. And by the way, those were films of the 1965 Derby. The Derby ended, we went back to Spendthrift Farms for an after the Derby lawn party. We met a lot of nice people and chatted amiably about this and that and the Derby, but always the conversation revolved around the good old days, to Man of War and Citation and Nashua. It was all very quiet, very friendly, and all in all, a lovely way to end a memorable day. We stayed on until sundown, just relaxing, and then someone suggested the Brown Hotel and one of the most popular musical combos in Kentucky, the Jug Band. Now you just mentioned Jug Band anywhere in the state, and they know you're talking about this group. This jug band has been together for about 15 or 16 years, and at the Brown Hotel, they're in demand for every kind of social affair, from a routine cocktail party to a college prom or fraternity dance. And so, with jug and fiddles howling Dinah, we called it quits for the day on our vacation tour in the land of bluegrass. Remember this place, Levi Jackson State Park, if you're planning a trip to Kentucky soon. It's located at the town of London in the southeastern part of the state. 
The park is a historical shrine to the memory of the pioneers who brought civilization to what was then a wild wilderness. All that is here is authentic or a faithful reproduction. And the park is worth the visit just to sit and watch this romantic old mill, McCarg's Mill, dating back to 1812. A similar park, Pioneer Memorial, is recommended if your visit is limited to the Lexington-Frankfurt area. Pioneer Park is located at Harrodsburg, an hour's drive south of Lexington. And of special interest at this park is the huge reconstruction of a typical settlement fort. Now, these forts were not intended as permanent living quarters. They were generally built by a band of settlers as a sort of temporary camp until the nearby wilderness had been cleared and peace had been made with the Indian tribes. A blockhouse twice as high as the walls was constructed in each of the four corners of the square or rectangular fortification. And note the sundial built into the wall of this blockhouse. There are many interesting side lights within Pioneer Park among them, the Lincoln Marriage Temple, a brick building sheltering the cabin in which Lincoln's parents were born. The Abraham Lincoln birthplace near Hodgenville, 50 miles south of Louisville, is deservedly Kentucky's number one tourist attraction. And by a huge oak called the Boundary Oak stood this cabin, the birthplace of the man many historians consider the greatest of America's presidents. The original cabin has been moved from one place of honor to another, but today you will find it permanently displayed, the original, mind you, in this pink granite and marble memorial building located at the birthplace shrine and built especially to preserve the cabin. Well, when Lincoln was two years of age, the family moved to a farm on Knob Creek, about 10 miles from the Lincoln birthplace. This cabin, unlike the other, is a reproduction. But forevermore, Knob Creek would be known as the boyhood home of Abraham Lincoln. If you've never met a Kentucky colonel, here is the absolute, the perfect prototype. He became a millionaire after he retired by boosting Kentucky Fried Chicken. But that's not what he talked about. Meet Colonel Harlan Sanders of Shelbyville. Howdy, Jack. I know you enjoy in Kentucky the bluegrass state, and it's famous, isn't it, for its fine horses and pretty women, and of course, the traditional mint julep. And I'll tell you something about that mint julep. It takes longer to make a mint julep than a lot of people would think. You take a glass of crushed ice, and you put about 25 mint leaves in the top of it. Then we take two spoonfuls of sugar, two teaspoons of sugar, round it up, and then you bruise it very gently because the old colonel says that a mint leaf is more tender than a woman's heart, you see. And the more gently it's bruised or caressed, the more good that it gives off. When your mint is sufficiently bruised, then we add one jigger only of Kentucky bourbon. And then it's ready to drink. Uh, Jack, you know that Georgia claims that they was the originator of the mint julep, but we know that they make their mint juleps out of moonshine liquor and sweeten the sorghum molasses. And the Yankees up north, they make their mint juleps with Scotch whiskey and cream to mint. And we know there isn't but one genuine mint julep, and that's like the old colonel makes them in Kentucky. Here's one I made about 30 minutes ago, and I'll show you how to drink it, because it takes about 20 minutes to drink one. You take about four or five drops, let it roll off your tongue, and then you breathe up through your nostrils. And I don't care where you go, anywhere in the world, and have mint juleps anywhere, it'd never be one like the old Colonel makes in Kentucky. In the land of the bluegrass, there is water aplenty. For example, Kentucky State Lake at Gilbertsville. And in Kentucky, when they say lake, they mean something like a small ocean for this one lake has 2,300 miles of shoreline, laced with picturesque coves and inlets. 
And this lake, incidentally, is just one feature of what is really a huge vacation park designed for the tourist. Lake Cumberland at Jamestown is another water wonderland. Smaller than Kentucky Lake, nevertheless, Cumberland has 1,255 miles of shoreline, and it is one of the world's 10 largest man-made lakes, over 100 miles long. The lake is impounded by Wolf Creek Dam, which stretches across the Cumberland River. Cumberland Falls is not related to the lake, but the falls are a main attraction at Cumberland National Forest, just a short distance from the Mammoth Resort Lodge. And this is it, the Niagara of the South, largest of all U.S. waterfalls east of the Rockies, except for Niagara itself. That band at the right is a rainbow, and isn't this a dreamy place to spend an afternoon? This mountain pass at Middlesboro on the Tennessee border is the legendary Cumberland Gap, discovered in 1750. The importance of the gap is this. It enabled the colonial pioneers to push on through the mighty Alleghenies. Now keep in mind that for nearly 150 years after Virginia was settled, the colonials were unable to penetrate these lofty ridges. The gap provided a natural passage through the mountainous barrier. But even after the 1750 discovery, the gap was no picnic. At the visitor center, we saw these paintings depicting a typical winter crossing over the gap and into the Kentucky Territory. I must shamefully admit that until now, I had never heard of Bardstown, Kentucky, some 60 or 70 miles from Louisville. Bardstown is worth knowing. It is the second oldest city in Kentucky, and this white inn, the Talbot Tavern, is the oldest hotel west of the Alleghenies. Also a historic landmark is St. Joseph's Cathedral, the first Catholic cathedral west of the same Alleghenies. But with due respect to this handsome house of worship, visitors come to Bardstown for only one reason, my old Kentucky home now a state park and truly a shrine of the entire civilized world. The Kentucky home was not, as we might imagine, the home of Stephen Foster, but of an older cousin, Judge John Rowan. And no family except the Rowans ever occupied the stately house until finally, in 1922, Mrs. Madge Rowan Frost, its last mistress, sold the property to the state of Kentucky. Hi, Jack. Welcome to my old Kentucky home, the plantation immortalized by Stephen Foster's song. We're members of the cast of the Stephen Foster story. A musical plays each summer in an outdoor amphitheater nearby. One of the favorite songs from that production is Camp Town Races. We'd like to sing it for you. Go, Camp Town ladies, sing this song. The Camp Town race tracks five miles long. I've come down there with my hat caved in. I go back home with a pocket full of tin. Oh, do do do. Wind to run all night, wind to run all day. I'll bet my money on a bob till night. Somebody bet on the day. Wind to run all night, wind to run all day. I'll bet my money on a bob till night. Somebody bet on the day. Wind to run all night, wind to run all day. I'll bet my money on a bob till night. Somebody bet on the day. Jack, this piano is well over 100 years old, and I'm afraid it doesn't play as well as it used to. I'm seated in the parlor of my old Kentucky home. It was a plantation that was owned by the Rowan family of Bardstown and was home to four generations of Rowans from 1795 to 1922. An interesting sidelight is that the Rowans were cousins of Stephen Foster, the great American composer. He visited the plantation many times, and in the summer of 1852, he visited here, and inspired by the beauty of the plantation and this lovely home, 
He seated himself at this very piano and composed one of his most famous songs, My Old Kentucky Home. Notice that the instrument here is made of entirely of rosewood. It shows remnants of mother of pearl inlay, and the keyboard is entirely of mother of pearl. Stephen Foster composed the music of My Old Kentucky Home at this piano. background separates Paducah, Kentucky from the state of Illinois. The city was named by General William Clark in honor of a friendly Kentucky Indian chief, Paduk. Audubon is not a name commonly associated with Kentucky. We think in terms of New York and Pennsylvania in connection with a brilliant French Creole immigrant. Yet it was in Kentucky, Louisville and Henderson to be exact, that John James Audubon executed much of his early and most exciting work. You know, as a rule, our America cameras are invited everywhere, but this man-made mass of stone and steel was the exception. The warning sign comes right to the point in six words. Armed guard, treasury department, keep out. That's right, Fort Knox. Kentucky has natural wonders galore, and here is one that has been attracting tourists from all over the globe for more than 150 years. Yes, a century and a half ago, people marveled at Mammoth Cave, describing it as the greatest cave that ever was, you all. Well, we all can believe this much. Even subsequent underground discoveries elsewhere have not diminished the fame of this enormous subterranean valley. Well, it's time to leave the bluegrass state. Looking back, I would have to say that the key to the success of your vacation in Kentucky is variety. There is so much here to satisfy every taste, every concept of what a vacation should be like. You can relax, have fun, meet interesting people, see unusual things, and still learn a great deal about America's glorious past. That's quite a package, but then, that's Kentucky. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed tonight's armchair vacation and that we'll meet again next week somewhere in America. Until then, Jack Douglas saying thank you so much and good night, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. <laughs>